Well, aloha, everybody. Aloha, Pastor Mark. Who's preaching today? Ooh, funny you should ask because our assistant pastor in uh, Northern California is with us today, and Matt Potter's a dear brother and has been with our church family since we started really in that first year, 18 years ago. And it's always a privilege to have him in town. Usually when he's preaching, I'm not here. So this is a joy for me to get to enjoy the message as well. Would you welcome Pastor Matt as he shares with us today? Well, it's uh, good to be with you. Uh, kind of on vacation uh, and so uh, I booked my vacation through a new company uh, Mark Barrett Tours <laughs> the first uh, the first wing took place last night uh, which was a driving tour of Burbank filled with historical and geographical references as well as personal anecdotes uh, I recommend it uh, and so uh, if you sign up within a week and use the passcode Pastor Matt uh, you can get an added bonus on your tour and he will get you close enough to the horses at the LA Equestrian Center that you can smell them. <laughs> uh, we're going to be in Joshua chapter 14 and if you want you can put a finger in the book of Hebrews because we'll be flipping back and forth uh, through that. Uh, because I think that the, the writer of Hebrews draws a lot from uh, the experiences of the children of Israel during their wilderness wanderings and also in their, uh, the aftermath. Um, before we get too far into it, I do want to uh, just read the entire passage from Joshua to you so you guys can get a sense. So we'll be in Joshua chapter 14, uh, looking at verses 6 through 15. So it reads, Then the children of Judah came to Joshua in Gilgal, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, said to him, You know the word which the Lord said to Moses, the man of God, concerning you and me in Kadesh Barnea. I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to spy out the land, and I brought back word to him as it was in my heart. Nevertheless, my brethren who went up with me uh, made the heart of the people melt, but I wholly followed the Lord my God. So Moses swore on that day saying, surely the land where your, your foot has trodden shall be your inheritance and your children's forever because you have wholly followed the Lord my God. And now behold, the Lord has kept me alive as he said these 45 years ever since the Lord spoke the word to Moses while Israel wandered in the wilderness. And now, here I am this day, 85 years old. As yet, I am as strong this day as the day that Moses sent me. Just as my strength was then, so now is my strength for war, both for going, in, going out and for coming in. Now therefore, give me this mountain of which the Lord spoke in that day. For you heard in that day how the Anakim were there, and that their cities were great and fortified. It may be that the Lord will be with me, and I shall be able to drive them out, as the Lord said. And Joshua blessed him, and gave, him Hebron, and gave Hebron to Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, as an inheritance. Hebron, therefore, became the inheritance of Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, to this day, because he wholly followed the Lord, the God of Israel. And the name of Hebron, formerly known as Kiriath Arba. Arba was the greatest man among the Anakim. The land had rest from war. So how many of you come to church every week because you need to be reminded that the world is in bad shape? How many of you come to church uh, every week because you need to remind it on how to be saved? Shouldn't be too many of you. I was recently uh, attending a church where, uh, and I don't know if this was because we're so close to Sacramento or not, 
but the topic before service usually centered around politics. You know, and I understand a righteous anger at what's going on. I understand it's troubling, but I think that a lot of times for Christians, we kind of lose our focus. You know, and, and I think that part of it comes from the idea that many of us have been told for so long that the goal is to get into heaven. And then we become saved and we just wait. And the process is kind of becomes like almost a, a crossing of our fingers to say, oh, maybe today. When are you coming, Lord? When is it going to happen? I'm waiting here. And I think it, it becomes a problem because as Christians, we're called to so much more than that. The goal is not to get into heaven. That was the starting point. There's a deeper purpose for why God has saved us, and he certainly has, and why he's going to save us in the future. And a lot of times we get tripped up because we get caught up in the world. And we begin looking at those things around us. And we need to remember that we live in an age of faith, not an age of sight. The age of sight will come and all things will be opened up and we'll be able to understand and see how it all works together and how it did. And I think, at least for me, I'll probably be a little embarrassed that I got tripped up so many times thinking one way because I was following what I was seeing with my eyes rather than trusting in what God has said. And so my hope this morning is to get you to maybe readjust your focus. Maybe begin to think about what's to come. The Bible constantly tells us that we're to set our sights on what's coming. That we don't trust what we can see in this world because God ultimately has a plan that he's working out. You know, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, Paul tells us that the earthly experiences of the Israelites from Exodus through their possession of the promised land was intended to be an example for us. Their earthly experiences are a type and the anti-type is the spiritual experience of Christians. So, you know, if I brought in a picture of my friend Sharon here and I showed you the photograph and I said, this is my friend Sharon, that is a representation. It's a type, if you will. But the anti-type would be if I brought Sharon up and stood her up in front of you and said, this is my friend Sharon. That's the real representation. That's who she is. That's the actual. That's what the anti-type is. And so it's not to discount what Israel did or went through. Those are all historical facts. But they're designed to teach us a lesson about it. And so when we look at this passage, uh, it's important to remember that, that it's, the Bible is giving us a type of our Christian experience. Now, it's not the same as allegory. You know, it's not that all of you read this passage here in Joshua or any other passage in the Old Testament, and it has some kind of secret hidden meaning, and every detail has a different meaning to it. That's not what we're talking about here. Uh, this is just a type. It's an experience. It's a representation of the things that we can expect. So when we look at this passage, I want to lay out just a couple things. Uh, the promised land that we're talking about, this land that Caleb inherits, it is not heaven. It is not a picture of heaven. The promised land is never intended to be a picture of heaven. Why? Well, the big glaring thing is because there's war there. The children of Israel had to go in and fight and dispossess those people. The promised land is a picture of the rest that could occur if the people of God were obedient and what they would inherit. Uh, it was a representation of the life that they could have, that abundant life that is promised to us when we obey and we seek after God and we follow him by faith. Uh, and so when we contrast now Caleb with this unfaithful generation, that's exactly what we're doing. 
We're not contrasting Caleb and saying Caleb is a believer and all the Israelites who wandered and ended up dying in the wilderness were unbelievers. That's not what this is. They were all saved. If you remember and you follow the type, you remember that all of Israel was passed over. Remember, they applied the blood of the lamb to the doorstep and their, and their doorposts and they were delivered. That is a picture of salvation. They all crossed the Red Sea, right? The Lord opened up the Red Sea, spread it out. They descended down into the bed of the sea, which is like a picture of dying. And they walked up the east side, and that's a picture of resurrection. It's an identification of the new life that they were to have. So salvation, as we understand it, is our taking care of. We are talking about saved people here. When we get into this, you know, it, the, one of the familiar translations is, well, if you don't demonstrate good works, that good works are a proof that you're saved. And that's not what we're talking about here. Uh, and, and we'll get into this more, more deeply. But you need to understand that we're contrasting faithful believers and unfaithful believers and the consequences that can arise. Finally, uh, uh, I wanted to read the passage to you because I wanted to give you that phrase, that, that magnificent phrase that Caleb uh, gives in verse 12, where he says, give me this mountain. Give me this mountain. It was what God promised him. It's what, it, what uh, he was seeking and what, it's what motivated him. Uh, and the mountain in the Bible can often uh, represent something stable. Uh, but it can also represent something on almost an insurmountable object. But I think in this passage, we need to understand that a mountain can also represent a kingdom. And I would point you to Daniel chapter 2. Remember Nebuchadnezzar's statue. And he said that after the statue was saw, they saw a stone that was cut out without hands. And that stone smashed into the feet of the statue and destroyed it. And that stone became a mountain that filled the whole earth. And commentators generally believe that that mountain is a representation of Jesus' kingdom that he will establish on earth during his thousand year reign. Uh, I also remind you that when God chose Israel, he called them and said, you're to be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Now they, through unbelief, fail to realize that. But the idea of the promised land is God establishing that kingdom that he originally intended to do through Israel. He will then in the future do through Jesus Christ. So as we lay this out, you need to keep those things in mind uh, as we look at this. Uh, because we're really seeing a man in Caleb who is really fighting for the promise. And even though he can't see it. And even though everything in his uh, earthly existence, his sight tells him that he won't be able to do that, by faith, he actually achieves. And by faith, he inherits what God told him he would through the power of God and not through his own efforts. So when we turn our attention to, uh, to verse 6, it says the children of Judah came to Joshua and Gilgal. Now, as far as background and context goes, we need to understand that the children of Israel have already crossed over into the promised land, and they've been fighting for five years within the land, trying to dispossess and take uh, possession of the promised land. Joshua is getting up there in years, and God said, okay, it's time. Even though the task is not complete, it appears that the children of Israel have at least uh, managed to defeat the standing armies within the promised land. So sure, there's villages and settlements and cities throughout that are still possessed by the Canaanites and the other uh, inhabitants of the land. But Israel has established enough of a foot, foothold in the land that God has told them, okay, now we need to divide the land. And he's going to say, you need to cast lots and determine the borders for each tribe and where each tribe is going to settle. And then that tribe in that particular area is to finish the job and to drive those people out and to take possession of it. So before they do this, it appears that the children of Judah come to Joshua at Gilgal. 
Now we know that the casting of lots happened at Shiloh because that's where the tabernacle was. So they haven't quite done this yet. So Caleb comes before that and he says, hey, Joshua, you were there. Remember what God said to me. Remember the fact that you and I were the only two spies out of the 12 that stood up and said, hey, we can do this. And because of that, God said that you and I would go in. Everybody else in that generation would have to die off in the wilderness because they did not believe. They did not believe what God had said. They didn't apply faith to that. They instead trusted their eyes only in what they saw. And so you remember the 10 spies came back and they said, hey, uh, the people in the land are giants. They're bigger than us. The land's good, yes, it's great. It's got great produce. We brought you a giant cluster of grapes to prove that, but we can't do this. And it says in Numbers 14 that Caleb quieted the people and he made his plea to them uh, because he fully believed. He fully believed that what God said he would do. And the people, the 10 spies swayed the people and they said, we can't do this. And in fact, they actually picked up stones and they were going to stone Moses, Aaron, Joshua, and Caleb because they were determined not to go in. And it was only because of the, the Lord actually showed up in the temple. The glory of the Lord appeared to him. And, and God basically said, you four step back out of the way because I'm going to wipe everybody out. And Moses interceded for them again. But he said, Caleb, because you are wholehearted, because you followed me fully, you're going to go into the land. And he said that Caleb had a different spirit in him. Now that shouldn't be understood as somehow Caleb was supernaturally empowered or he had some kind of gift. I would submit to you that Caleb had a faith where the children of Israel did not. Caleb was operating based on what God had said. Everyone else was based on operating based on what they could see. And it cost them. It cost them because they would not proceed with faith. The same consequence applies to us today. God has promised us specific things, particularly that he's coming back and he's going to rule and reign and that we're to take part in that kingdom. But so many Christians today are holding on to this idea that it's just about getting into heaven. I've got my fire insurance and it affects the way we approach things after we're saved. It affects the way we look at things because we're holding on when we should be going out and possessing. We should be embracing the abundant life that Jesus has provided for us here and now and not waiting and hoping that everything will end up okay once we get to heaven. We're promised that we are going to be rewarded for the works that we perform if they're performed correctly and in obedience to the will of God. But we can also lose those rewards if we're not doing those things. We can miss out on everything that God has for us if we continue to live with one foot in the world trying to navigate what we see and what we experience with what we know is to be true, even if it's in the future. So we need to understand this. We need to understand that it's about finishing the work. God started the work when he saved us, when he convinced us that we needed Jesus to give us forgiveness for our sins. But then he gave us the Holy Spirit to empower us to work through a process of spiritual maturity to sanctify us so that we could do his work and finish what he started. If you look at in Hebrews chapter 3, the writer of Hebrews talks about this very thing where uh, uh, the, the children of Israel falling are, are failing to enter the land. And in Hebrews chapter 3, starting in verse 16, it says, For who, having heard, speaking of the children of Israel, that unfaithful generation, who, having heard, rebelled? Indeed, was it not all who came out of Egypt led by Moses? 
Now with whom was he angry forty years? Was it not with those who uh, sinned, whose corpses fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who did not obey? So we see that they could not enter because of unbelief. So he's drawing this picture, the writer of Hebrews is, between that unfaithful generation and Christians today who will not progress in their faith because they just won't take God's word for it. They will not embrace what God has said about them and what God's purpose is. And people are, are faltering, Christians are faltering and living a life of spiritual impoverishment and ruin because they won't accept what God has said is true. And that's all faith is. Faith is simply believing what God said is true. Even in spite of what we may see or hear or experience on earth, faith is simply believing what God has said. And so if you go on uh, to Hebrews chapter one, he then applies it to the Hebrews, uh, to his audience and ultimately to us. He says, therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, let us fear lest any of you seem to have come short of it. There are consequences for not spiritually maturing. There are, the con there are consequences for not growing in Christ. And so many of us today are tied up in the world and trying to navigate and making our life here today as comfortable as possible that it's costing us in our growth with Christ. In verse, uh, if you drop down to verse 13 of Hebrews 4, it says, or excuse me, verse 11, it says, let us therefore be diligent. That word diligent means to strain, to put forth an effort. This doesn't just happen naturally. Everything within our flesh will fight against us to mature, to try and grow. And the writer of Hebrews says, let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience, the same example of those un unbelieving Israelites. For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and joints and marrow, and as a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight. There is no Christian or unbeliever hidden from his sight. But all things are naked and open to the, to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. As Christians, we're not judged in the sense of our eternal destiny. That is a settled issue. You've committed your life to Jesus Christ and you've accepted his work on the cross and his forgiveness, you are saved. I believe the Bible is very clear about the issue of eternal security. And it was nothing you earned, it was a gift and it cannot be lost or given up. But you are called to progress and you are and can and, and will be are considered falling short if you do not grow and proceed and continue to obey from faith to faith, as Roman says. As each situation grows, as you continue to surrender and to trust in God. And so there is something to lose. It's not like heaven is not some great socialist society where we all get in and everything becomes equal. It's not what the Bible teaches. There's a reason why the New Testament is continually filled with passages imploring us to grow, to move forward, to make our calling and election sure, to do all of these things, because there's more to God's purpose than just getting us into heaven. And I see a lot of ruin and a lot of hurt unnecessary because people won't embrace what God has said. And they get hung up on these things of the world. Uh, and to me, uh, when people start talking and discussing, well, Sacramento ruining, you know, the politics and this, uh, I have to say, what, 
do you expect? These are sinners behaving exactly as they should, as sinners. So why is it tripping you up? Why are you spending so much time talking about it and worrying about it? It's going to happen. But the great news is that you are delivered from all that. And it may be another 45 years like we're going to find out with Caleb. But we are to continue to progress and endure in faith. And if we don't, even though we don't see it, it will cost us. So we need to continue to move forward and finish the work. See, Caleb understood that what was going to be achieved, the dispossession, possessing of all of these different inhabitants and the establishment of Israel was going to be done through God's ability. But he was going to have to partner with God. Caleb was actually going to go out and fight for what was his. And it wasn't going to be in his own strength, but it was going to be God working through him. That's how faith grows. We come up against a situation that we realize we cannot overcome ourselves. And we surrender to God and we trust in him based on what he's told us. And we allow God to work for us. A great example of this, and we won't turn there, but in the book of James chapter 2 is Abraham. Uh, and it said that Abraham, James tells us that uh, it's that whole discussion about faith without works is dead, right? Uh, and people get all in an uproar because they think, oh, James is contradicting Paul. They don't realize that James is not talking about that initial moment of belief, that initial conversion. James is talking about a walk of faith. Uh, what good is it to have that initial belief in that God saved you and then not go out and live differently because of what God has said. James calls that dead faith. And he doesn't mean that people die in their sins. He says it's useless. It's just words if it doesn't produce a change in you. And he uses Abraham as an example. And he says that Abraham uh, was uh, received a, uh, remember he offered Isaac. Uh, he offered Isaac as a sacrifice. Uh, and that was in Genesis chapter 22. But that wasn't when Abraham was saved. Abraham was saved back in Genesis chapter 12. When God called him and said, leave your land, go to this land I'm going to tell you about, and I'm going to give it to you as an inheritance. Abraham believed and went. Then in chapter 15 of Genesis, it said that God declared Abraham righteous. Years after he initially left and believed. And then in verse 22, for our chalk, sorry, Genesis 22, it's a picture of Abraham acting in accordance with what God had declared him to be 30 years earlier in Genesis chapter 15. And so we see this development going on. God declares us righteous, but then we're to finish the work. And when we do that, it proves that God was right in the first place by declaring us righteous because we're living exactly as he said. And it says in James chapter two that, that after that, people started calling Abraham the friend of God. Now that sounds kind of, you know, quaint or simple in today's terms, but you didn't throw around language like that back in Abraham's day. And people didn't believe that God was near and dear. God was awesome and powerful. So to say that Abraham was a friend of God meant something. And it was because Abraham showed it in his walk of faith. And that's what we're seeing from Caleb is that he's partnering with God. Hey, God said that we're going to possess the land. So we need to go in and possess it. And we don't have to rely upon our works or our strength or our ability or our height but we rest in the fact that God has already said it. We just have to go and take it. So there's a partnering that has to take place. You have to partner with God. You have to agree that you're going to surrender 
your will, your desires, and give them over to God and allow him to complete the work through you. Going back to Joshua in chapter uh, 14, moving on to verse 10, Caleb says, and now behold, the Lord has kept me alive, as he said, these 45 years. Ever since the Lord spoke this word to Moses, while Israel wandered in the wilderness, and now here I am this day, 85 years old. As yet, I am as strong uh, this day as on the day that Moses uh, sent me. Just as my strength was then, so now is my strength for war, both for going out and for coming in. Caleb's focus was on what was out ahead of him. Caleb's focus was that mountain that God had promised him 45 years earlier. Didn't matter what was there, didn't matter what he saw now. All that mattered was what God had said he was going to do. And he took that as, uh, as reassurance. He said, hey, you know what? I am still alive after 45 years. God said that I would inherit and I would see the land and I'm still here. So now I'm going to claim that promise. And he did so. He focused out what was out ahead of him. The same is true for us. Colossians tells us, set your mind on things above. We shouldn't be, doesn't matter what's going on in this earth, what people are jockeying for, what positions they're looking for, what power they hope to grab, what company they're buying and how much they're buying it for and how it's going to affect your free speech and all the other things that are going on. Our focus is on the fact that Jesus is coming back one day to fulfill all those promises and we have a place in that kingdom. But only if we're mature enough to handle that. Only if we develop now. Only if we begin to apply God's word to our lives here and now. Israel's wanderings are a picture of spiritual impoverishment. And I want you to notice that Caleb, even though he believed, he still had to go 45 years walking through the wilderness with all of these people that have tried to stone him. How awkward, <laughs> you know, how difficult. And yet he still had to do that. And that's the position we find ourselves in today. We, not, not talking about unbelievers, not talking about the wicked. We're talking about other Christians who won't grab a hold, who oftentimes we should be influencing and saying, hey, you need to trust in the Lord. You need to live like this. Instead, they actually pull us away oftentimes. They, because they're carnal, they're one foot in the world, one foot in the church, and they influence us rather than us influencing them. And it took Caleb 45 years. So we need to understand, again, that the battle that's going on today for us is a battle for our soul. Your spirit, settled, new, new in Christ. The body, thank God we're getting a new one, a better one. I, do the, I thank God every morning when I try to crawl out of bed. Uh, <laughs> that I'm getting a new body. The battle that we're facing is for the soul. That's what we're seeking to save. That's what needs to be sanctified. The soul, uh, at least in biblical terms, is that place where the mind, the emotion, the desire, and the will all interact. And because of sin, it's corrupted. We need to be taught. We need to, as James says, receive the implanted word. It's already in there, we just need to receive it. We need to begin to apply it. We need to begin to use it and allow God to shape us and to bring out a lot of times in, in difficult situations, those things that trigger us and cause us to run back to the flesh. Those things that might cause us to stumble because when we do it, we've dealt so long with trying to handle it within our own emotions and within our own ways. We've, 
we design things on how to design ways on how to deal with troubling issues and struggles and we fall back to those because not because they work but because they're comfortable and God oftentimes is trying to reach us in that difficult time he's trying to say hey stop let me help you let me heal you with these things so that you can work and we can work on the soul so remember we need to have that idea that there's a patience to this that God is working through us and that we are called to endure that means enduring troubles and trials that means enduring those people who are Christians who are probably lovely people and very nice and you're happy to have them in the life but there are things in their life that could be pulling you away from resting in your faith you go back to Hebrews chapter 6 there's another warning for believers uh, the writer of Hebrews has just gotten through telling his audience that he wishes he could move on he can move away from the milk of the word to the meat of the word but he can't do that because they're dull of hearing because they just won't embrace God's word the way they should and so he says in verse 9 of chapter 6, But beloved, we are confident of better things concerning you. Yes, things that accompany salvation, though we speak in this manner. For God is not unjust to forget your work and labor of love, which you have shown towards, uh, toward his name, in that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. So these believers, they are doing some of the work. And he's saying, hey, God's not going to forget that, but there's more work to be done. There's more perfecting within you. There's more maturing that needs to happen. And you need to move beyond the milk of the word and, and listen. And in verse 11, he says, and we desire that each one of you show the same diligence. Again, the same effort, the same straining uh, to the full assurance of hope till the end. Is basically saying continue to work continue to operate with that hope until it is you are fully assured of it you need to continue to hope to continue to focus out on what's ahead the promise of God to you continue continue work at it continue implying that applying that to your life and he says in verse 12 that you do not become sluggish but imitate those who through faith and in patience inherit the promises so we see that it's faith and patience that operate together it's that full conviction that what God says is true and though we go through trial and struggle and tribulation it gets outweighed by that conviction of what's to come that hope that is within us that keeps us moving forward that doesn't cause us to shrink back and he says, use those as an example. Use people like Caleb to encourage you. Use uh, those mentioned in Hebrews chapter 11 to encourage you to come to that place where you are fully assured and fully expect that what God says is going to happen despite what you may see. That's what's before us. There's patience that needed to be that needs to be added to this promise. To close back in Joshua verses 12, it says, Caleb continues, Now therefore give me this mountain of which the Lord spoke in that day. For you've heard that in that day how the Anakim were there, and that the cities were great and fortified. It may be that the Lord will do will be with me, and I shall be able to drive them out as the Lord has said. Caleb's ready to continue to fight. And I think there's a reason why we find Caleb's story at the beginning of the re these following chapters where we get what seems to be boring information about all the borders that the tribes will have and where they're going to be located in the promised land. It's because Caleb is following or setting an example of what should have been done. They still needed to dispossess the people. 
They still needed to finish the work. And Caleb went out and did that. And I don't think it's uh, a coincidence or anything that the place where Caleb went to was, had leftovers from the giant that we learn about in Genesis chapter six. There's deeper spiritual significance to that. That's another sermon, maybe on my next vacation. <laughs> but there's giants in the land, the very thing that the people feared and they had set up a shop there, fortified their cities in what would become the city of Hebron, which is a, about 3,000 feet uh, elevation, sits between two mountain peaks, there's a valley there uh, that, that the city sat in. Uh, and the Anakim, the relatives, the leftovers, these giants were there. And that's where Joshua says, Caleb, that's where you're, that's where you're going because those people, those giants need to be taken care of. And Caleb had enough faith to do that. Uh, and, and he took that. And so he's saying, you know what, give me this mountain. Let's fulfill God's promise. Give me the kingdom and I'll take care of it. And it's funny when your focus and your hope is on the mountain or the kingdom or the promise, the giants look pretty small. There is something about the assurance that God gives to us when we operate in faith and obedience, that we can trust in him to do what he has said. And so Joshua blessed him and he gave Hebron to Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, as an inheritance. Uh, that driving out of those of Anak and his relatives, uh, the renaming of Hebron, uh, uh, of Hebron, all of that comes through God working through Caleb, through God working through that faith. Hebron therefore became the inheritance of Caleb, the son of Jephunneh the Kenizzite, to this day, because he wholly followed the Lord God of Israel. And the name of Hebron, formerly known as Kirjath Arba, Arba was the name of the, the greatest man among the Anakim. Uh, and then it says, uh, after Caleb drove them out and dispossessed them, the land had rest from war. The promise was realized. The promised land was about achieving the rest, uh, about coming to a place of abundant life uh, through faith in God. That is what happened here, is that the, the rest came because of what Caleb believed, uh, and he, was, he allowed God to use him. One final uh, thought from Hebrews chapter 10. As we understand that when we embrace the promise, our perspective shifts. Things look different from the side of faith uh, when we're trusting in what God has said rather than what we can see with our own eyes. In Hebrews chapter 10, verses, verse 35, to the end it says therefore do not cast away your confidence which has great reward for you have need of endurance so that after you have done the will of God you may receive the promise after you have done the will of God it's not once you walk through the pearly gates it's after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. And then he quotes from Habakkuk. He says, for yet a little while, and he who is coming will come and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith, but if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. Very famous by uh, that phrase there, the just shall use by faith, used three times in the, in the New Testament seems to be a favorite. And a lot of times uh, I hear a lot of commentators and pastors teach that this has to do with that initial point of salvation. That uh, the just basically, if you accept Jesus by faith, you're declared righteous and just. True, but not the context of what's going on here. When you read Habakkuk, uh, Habakkuk is questioning God and he's looking at uh, the people of Judah 
the people of Israel, the 10 tribes had already been carried away by Assyria. Judah, he noticed, was increasingly becoming immoral. So much so that the leaders and, and the, the tribe elders and the people in power were oppressing the regular Judeans. And Habakkuk basically asked God, how long are you gonna let this go? And God answers and says, oh, judgment is coming. I'm going to use Babylon to come and take away Judah into captivity. And Habakkuk's like, wait a second. How can you use somebody, a nation that is less righteous than, than Israel to judge righteous Israel? And God says, I got it on in control. I have a plan. But you need to realize that righteous Israel is going into captivity. And the just, the righteous, are going to live by faith through that. They're still going to have the troubles. They're still going to have the trials. They're still going to have the challenges. They're to respond in faith that I will preserve them through that, that I will carry them through. And they need to believe my word that they're coming back. It's the same message. He, the writer of Hebrews closes out that chapter and says, we're not of those who draw back to perdition. We don't fall back into destruction, but we are those who believe to the saving of the soul. We are those who believe that God is working within us and that if we respond by faith, that if we live a life characterized by faith, trusting in what God has said, understanding that one day we will be in his kingdom and we will have a purpose there we're gonna make it through anything that this world or anybody else can throw at us. So my encouragement to you is to hold on. The salvation we have is far greater than what most of us know. But we can know because God has told us. I would encourage you to make every effort. Be diligent. If there are areas in your life where things, I hate to use this word, but where things trigger you to fall back into the flesh, to handle them in your own way, under your own power. Go before the Lord and ask him to help you. It may not come instantaneously, but the process, however long it takes, is designed to build patience and hope within you so that you can achieve those promises. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you that you have given us those promises, that there is so much to our salvation, we can never possibly grasp all that you have for us. But Lord, help us to seek after those things. Help us to continue to focus on what's out of head, that we wouldn't stumble and fall and be tripped up by the things that we see but rather we would be assured by the things that we hear from your word. Help us to grow. Help us to put aside anything and everything that would cause us to fall back into the world. Cleanse us and, and seek to heal us. And we ask that you even bring uh, through our prayers, through self-examination, areas in our, in our lives that are carnal, that are fleshly, so that we can allow you to heal us. We pray for more of your Holy Spirit to guide us and direct us. We pray for a sensitivity to hear you when you speak, whether it be through another individual or through your word, through quiet time. May we constantly be 
seeking to hear you out. May we develop the assurance and the faith and the wholeheartedness of a Caleb to continue to seek after you. Thank you for my brothers and sisters here, for the encouragement that they bring to me, to one another. What a great design you have for the church that we can come together and support one another, remind one another of these things, encourage one another. May we continue to walk in faith and live in obedience to you. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, would you stand with me? What a great word of confidence that we can turn to. So if I have this right, Pastor Matt, when I'm driving down the freeway and I hear an interview from the Senate chamber and someone's asked, do you believe a woman become, can become a man? Yes, I do. Do you believe that man, that a woman when she becomes a man can have an abortion or just backwards? Yes, I do. Do you all the crazy stuff that I heard this week, it's not to beat me down, it's to simply say, oh, check that one off the list. And here's another one. And I'll check that off. And all of this is happening, just as Romans 1 says, professing to be wise, they become fools. But for us professing Christ, we become stronger and stronger. So let's pray this week for strength and encouragement for each other. And let's praise our God, who is always faithful. Thou art worthy. Thou art worthy. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory, glory and honor, glory and honor and power. For Thou hast created, has all things created, for Thou hast created. And for thy pleasure they are created. Thou art worthy, O Lord. God bless you. Have a great, confident week in the Lord.